I can't ever remember anyone being asked for a sports car to follow a hearse on a funeral before. In the UK today, we're spending more money than ever on our funerals. For some, it will be the most extravagant event of their lives. You can have the horses, the caskets, they can be as flash as you like. 20, 30 limousines if you want. You can hire buses, have a helicopter if you wanted. The manufacturer provides a list of famous people who have been in their caskets. It is a lot of money, but money's not an object when it comes to burying someone that you love, really. We follow Britain's top undertakers. If I could manage to get one donkey, one pony, a couple of goats and half a dozen hens, is that the sort of volume that you're thinking of? As they strive to meet their customers' increasing demands. Make sure we nail this. And then go round. It's too yeah. steep, Yeah, and then look, boom, this is ridiculous. <laughs> What's the step? All right. There's always that pressure to make it perfect, to make it right. The average funeral costs three and a half thousand pounds. But many of us spend a lot more. In Buckinghamshire, successful farming family The Smiths are planning their brother Nathan's funeral. And with an unlimited budget, they're pulling out all the stops. We're all sport now. Christmas, birthday, all the time. No, there was not, no price on anything for him. He basically got everything he wanted. You could call him a sport brat, really. <laughs> He'd go, no, I'm not. We've got to give him, you know, the best send-off we can. How much do you reckon in total all this has come to? So we spent over £4,000 on flowers. That's cost from a wholesaler. And we've branched out to two other florists, and they're both coming in at, like, £3,000 each, their bill. The family has put their lives on hold to organise most of this funeral themselves, arranging catering for the expected 1,000 guests. And spending £10,000 on cars, including 10 matching Rolls-Royce Phantoms. It's taken weeks to make and design over a hundred floral arrangements of everything that was ever important to Nathan, even his electric toothbrush. It was a case of what flowers we wanted, we just had. It's everything what Nathan would have liked, they done. We've got a Cadbury's Flag Pop yoghurt. Finish off the mobile phone. The pygmy goat that's on his farm. A little baby angel from my little nephew. He liked, like, James Bond, so it, my little um, boy Tommy wanted 007, so he wants it all sprayed red. We always used to watch EastEnders, like, we... Well, we'd be sat in his room and then he'd be like, Quick, 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 we're going to be standards. Quick, put it on the TV, quick. Why have we spent so much money on this funeral? We don't want him to go out, like, so he would be forgotten. We want it to be, like, the one that everyone will remember him. But everyone will remember him because it's Naif. Naif's just loved by everyone. We are all really... Mum brought us up to be very close, all of us, because there's one and nine, and it was a case of you look after. You don't come as, like, individual, you come as one as a whole. So we've all been brought up really close as a family. And Nath being in the wheelchair uh, pulls you even closer. This is Nath. This is our family portrait. So this is all of the children. That's all of us. So this is Nath's room. Because he was in the wheelchair, he had just about the shower in the room. Nathan was only 23 when he died. He went into hospital with breathing problems and sadly never recovered due to his existing medical condition. He had muscular dystrophy, and that's like a muscle-wasting disease. He started, like, when he was, I think he was six or seven. Dad noticed it first, cos he started to walk funny. And he, he said to my mum, buy him a decent pair of shoes. That's what Dad thought it was. So when she took him to the doctors, they said, oh, it's a one-in-a-million chance, it's not in the family. So we always tried to make his life as normal as it could be. I suppose he was like the centre of your family, from what I've heard. It was our life. We put Nate before we put our own children. He come first, and then our kids follow on. It was always like you base your life around what Nate wanted. The family is determined to give Nathan the best funeral possible. For them, money is no object. There's never been a budget when it comes to Nate. Even when he was alive, we didn't have a budget. It was what he wanted, he got. <laughs> There are 600,000 funerals in the UK every year.
At AW Limbs in Nottingham, they lay 100 people to rest every week. 2.20 in the west. Bentley Hearst and one Bentley limousine from Rudington Address. One of the company directors is Matthew. When people meet you and they ask uh, what your job is, if you tell them you're a funeral director, there's two reactions. They either run an absolute mile and don't want anything to do with you, um, or they'll be inquisitive and, and they want to know why. And the most straightforward answer for me is that it's a family business. My dad and my grandfather before him and my grandmother and great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather had all done the same thing. Planning a funeral can be pricey. £400 just for using the church, and then you've got the pastor on top of that. The cheapest and by far the most popular way to go is cremation. So this room here, this is the columbarium where we keep all of the cremated remains that have been collected from the crematorium. Um, we usually hold them just for a little bit of time, um, but we do have a number of cremated remains which have been here for a very, very long time, um, where families haven't collected them for whatever reason. The oldest set that we have um, dates right back until 1901, um, so really old. At £660, cremations are a third of the price of a burial, but either way, you'll need a coffin. This is our coffin and casket showroom. The coffins and casket that you see here are based at Catholics, you could say. They're traditional coffins with Christian imagery on them. In this case, an image of the Last Supper depicted inside the coffin lid. Most of us try to keep funeral costs down, but Matthew also deals with families who are willing to spend whatever it takes to have the perfect send-off. The caskets at the back of the room are the status symbol, really. So much so that the manufacturer provides a list of famous people who have been in their caskets. Michael Jackson, James Brown and one of the Kennedys. This casket is the Batesfield Promethean and, to my knowledge, is the most expensive casket that will be in stock in the UK. The casket is made of solid 48 ounce bronze, polished, and each piece is 24 karat gold plated. The Promethean casket also comes with its own handbook. The 15 year limited warranty and guarantee certificate. So there's a warranty? Why would you need a warranty? I don't know that anyone has ever claimed on the warranty, but it's that peace of mind for a client to know that when this casket is interred in the ground, it is absolutely safe and nothing will go wrong with it. Who'd buy one of these? The three that we've sold have all been to members of the travelling community. Today, Matthew is on his way to meet one traveller family who've got big plans. Just quickly show me that one, and you quickly show me this one. Irish travellers, the McCanns, have recently suffered the loss of their brother, Faino. Determined to give him one last big day, they've contacted Matthew and are keen to show him that only the best will do. What are you cleaning for? Uh, for Matthew to come over and um, to, like, uh, discuss about the funeral. But it sounds like he knows what he's doing. We're just putting all our trust in Matthew. And if Matthew pulls this off, what will happen? I guess he will be working for a lot of travellers. A lot of travellers. <laughs> Funeral director Matthew is on his way to arrange what could be one of his biggest ever funerals for traveller family, the McCanns. Hi there. Come in. Thank you very much. The travellers' funerals are almost always a big affair. Numbers of people, numbers of vehicles. Travellers like a good show and they like to have more and bigger of anything that we can provide. Would you be able to get Ben or a bus? Yeah, this kind of bus? bus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. It's an old London bus. Yeah. yeah. But I don't yeah. think I've ever... Well, robbed you in know, the Because it's 20 years ago he robbed yeah. the bus, so it's the very same thing. He robbed a bus? He robbed a bus. He got two years in jail for it, right? And I thought he was mad. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, they thought he was mad, didn't they? Mm. And the judge said, why would you go and rob a big bus? Because yeah. he said, I had no keys. He's right, he's right, he's right. He, he, he told the judge, he said, I had no keys. Listen, this is true, this is true. As well as the bus incident, Faino spent much of his life in and out of prison. 
before passing away at the age of 55. Yeah, yeah, so years, but it was always in for a bit, out for a bit. Yeah, never, yeah. Never, but never a long, long spell. He was never, it was never out for one Christmas in his whole lifetime. Honestly, no. Honestly. If Faye never spent a Christmas out, never spent a birthday out, he was never married. No. Yeah. So he's never had his big party. No. Yeah. And, and please, you know, I understand it's not a party, but yeah. but through life you have these these celebrations, whether it's a christening or whether it's a wedding or whether yeah. it's a, a Christmas party. Yeah. But actually, Faye has never had the chance to have his big celebration. Everyone is chipping in. Everyone, Everyone wants, wants and wants him to have the best. Which I hope I do. I think we've got all the right information. The brothers were saying that Faino had never had a lot in life when it came to material things. But by organising the funeral the way they have, they're giving Faino absolutely everything. And if there is an, an, an extra way to give uh, more bells and more whistles on top of what's already been arranged, the family are interested to know how they can do that. When the family were asked, first of all, why do they want to celebrate Faino's life in this way? The initial response from his sister was just simply that we loved him so much. And to celebrate their love, the family is sparing no expense. As well as the double-decker bus, they've requested five of Matthew's luxury cars, a Lamborghini, a red carpet, and even farmyard animals. Sometimes it is surprising at just how much people are willing to spend on a funeral for something that you could argue is not necessary. We could all be laid to rest in a cardboard coffin with a very simple service. In London, one of the biggest and busiest funeral parlours is Tea Cribs. They've been sending people out in style for 135 years. Are you the next of kin? One of their clients, 26-year-old Easton, is spending £30,000 to commemorate the life of his mum, Sharon. It's very expensive for funerals now. I think they could be more expensive or just as much as a wedding, really. Um, I think because that they're one-time event, so... You know once you've done it for my mum, she's never going to get that same event again. Easton's mum died six weeks ago, and he's preparing to see her for the last time. It's the first time I've seen her since she's passed, so I'm sort of excited, but then I'm like, oh, I wonder how she is. But yeah, it's literally the last, my last image, so I hope it's a beautiful image, of it, which I've been told it, she looks beautiful, so it'd be good to see her. That coffin is beautiful. Oh, with the makeup on. I think, I think she'll be upset with the makeup. My mum wore earlier makeup. <laughs> she pays me on so much makeup. Well, I guess it had to be done anyway. What? Happy now, I've seen her, but I just don't look like my mum at all. Big part's gone. I remember my mum that kind of like that sort of. So it's seeing her now is just yeah, wow. <laughs> mm. What is really thirty thousand? That's less than a thousand pound for each year she was alive, really. So and you think about what that person contributes. We can be too stingy in a way, we can be towards our loved ones. But sometimes you just say, do you know what, what the hell with it? Like what we done, we're just gonna give her what she deserves, really. The man in charge of helping to give Easton's mum everything she deserves is Undertaker, Marcus. My taste in certain things does surprise people, my kids especially. They say the music coming out of my car doesn't reflect the person sitting in it. Today, he's on his way to reserve a spot for Easton's mum in one of the country's most sought-after cemeteries. 
we're in the City of London Cemetery. Unfortunately, with like built-up areas like London, land is at a premium. The existing cemeteries are filling up quite quickly. The higher demand for anything does mean that costs go up. Research suggests that half of England's cemeteries will run out of space within the next 20 years. So securing your spot can be an expensive business. The vaults, they cost the most. They're about £32,000 in total. But that doesn't include the stone, of course, because then you could spend another 15, 20 on the stone. But your final resting place may not be as secure as you think. As most graves are sold with just a 100-year lease, there may be need in the future to reuse graves. You can dig people out of a grave that the lease has expired, place them to one side, and then you dig 20 foot down, place those one, two, three, four, five people 20 foot down, and then resell the burial plot above. There is ideas of doing that. Easton has decided on one of the most exclusive parts of the cemetery for his mum, the catacombs. An indoor cemetery with rows and rows of burial chambers. It's something she deserves, in a way, the best that we could provide for her. Because it would have been easy to say, do you know what, she's passed, even though she didn't want to be buried, we're just going to bury her, or oh, she didn't want to be cremated, we're just going to cremate her because it's a bit cheaper. It was more about, you know what, I believe that if my mum was there, she'd be like, yep, yeah, that's what I want. So that's why we went for it. The catacombs, they are £7,500 for a 100-year lease. That is just to purchase the cell, if you like. Some are wider than the others, but you've got to be careful that obviously the coffin fits, because you wouldn't want to get here and find out, you know, it doesn't go in. If you prefer somewhere more exclusive than the graveyard and you have enough land, you can be buried in your back garden. And with 95 acres of it, the Smith family has decided to create a bespoke tomb on their farm for their brother Nathan. The tomb is made of tiled walls, featuring family photos, and has taken 120 hours to make. If you said a normal grave, which is a hole in the ground, say that was Derek Trotter's Reliant, then this is your Rolls Royce. It's looking good. Yeah, it looks really nice. Really nice. It makes all those hours on the laptop digging out photos <laughs> worth well. I guess there are lots of people out there that wouldn't do something like this because they would just think that it would be a waste of money. Whereas for us, it's you don't worry about the money. You just do what you want to do. The whole family has spent the last fortnight preparing to make sure Nathan's funeral is everything he would have wanted. It's when things happen like that that, they, that you all come together. When, we, when it comes to, like, funeral, I know they're expensive anyway, but it didn't matter what it cost. It was what Mum wanted, that Mum picked, that Nath would have wanted. One of the most unique details is a bespoke painted casket, the first of its kind, and they've even bought a spare one in case they don't like it. Mum's got to check it over, make sure she's happy with it, and if she's not, we have got a blue one on stand. Even though we've seen the artwork and everything else, I think it's just a case of making sure that it's all perfect. Nice face. Is it expensive to get a coffin like that? I don't know. It's not a coffin, it's a casket. So I think they're more expensive, a coffin. A coffin's just like a normal, this has got all silver handles and that on it. Mum, what do you think of it? The, um, car, the coffin. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to have a second one now. We we'll stick to the first one, to our original plan. <laughs> so she doesn't need a second one. So how, how do you feel? I like it, I love it. I think it's really, really nice. Well pleased with it. With the casket chosen and the tomb finished, everything is finally ready for Nathan's funeral. Every family wants their funeral to be perfect. That's just natural, but some families more than others. You can tell that they are pouring over every detail, with every part of their heart and soul, and you really feel for them. In Nottingham,
Nottingham, Matthew is on a mission to source one very unusual detail for the McCann's funeral for their brother, Faino. They have asked for farmyard animals to grace the funeral procession, and Matthew is on the hunt for a Shetland pony. Good afternoon. I'm a funeral director, and I've been contacted by a family who are asking whether it's possible to have any farm animals at a burial. Oh. It's not something I've ever been asked for before. Following the advice of his newfound contact, Matthew heads off to seek out other suppliers. Hello. Oh, yes. Couldn't really commit to what we need. Uh, unfortunately, not willing to help us. Unfortunately, she doesn't think it's something she can help with. It's, I guess, out of her comfort zone, perhaps. Until success. Look at that mane. Isn't it? It's so thick. He's like just... Tina Turner, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this one takes forever, and this one's a bit of a speed demon, so... Well, that's good, because funeral pace is nice and slow. Yeah. The ponies ticked off the list, but Matthew's can-do attitude has set him up for a challenge. If a family asks for something that's unusual, we don't just say no. I think that the uh, best way to describe that is that yes is the answer. Now tell me what the question is. I've got an awful lot to do this week, and I've got an awful lot more to do now. There's a lot of arranging, a lot of organising. Um, I need to make sure that everything is checked and double-checked, because on a big funeral like this, in the same way that we would feel on any funeral, nothing can go wrong. It's the morning of Nathan's funeral, and his family is ready to see the culmination of all their hard work. Is this all about trying to just keep him close, keep him with you? Yeah, yeah. Just keeping his memory alive, really. Including the Rolls Royces, the procession stretches for over a mile bringing the whole town to a standstill. It's just a sign of respect, I think. The family that we're in, they all have big funerals. I don't even think it's about being flash, it's just what you, what you wanted to give him. There are over a thousand mourners, too many to fit inside the church. That proved to me the amount of people that were there, of how much he was well-liked and how much he was loved. sad occasion, we give thanks to God for Nathan's life and for all that he's meant to his family and friends. The farm will never be the same without you, Nathan. 23 is too young to be leaving us. We love you so much. A million times we will miss you. A million times we will cry. If love alone could have saved you, you never would have died. As the ceremony comes to an end, Everyone heads back to the farm, where even more guests arrive to show their respects. You can't put it into words what... It just feels like you've had your stomach ripped out. Because you're in such a state, even now, you, I, I look back and think, God, I, I couldn't even tell you it was there. As the day draws to a close, the funeral is just the start of the family's efforts to remember Nathan. <laughs> In London, Easton is busy organising his mum's funeral. Looking for a navy blue suit. Yeah. Um, with an, it's got to be a baby blue tie yeah. and a white shirt yeah. for, um, for all of us. He set himself a budget for the day of £30,000. It's uh, a lot of money. If you think about what you earn for a year, it, it is a lot of money, but 
like I keep saying, money's not an object when it comes to burying someone that you love, really, so... So do you earn 30,000 a year? Um, Pre-tax, yeah. <laughs> After tax, no. Oh, yes. Yes. Easton has taken the lead in arranging his mum's funeral. Being from a Caribbean background, it needs to be a large affair. It's taken six weeks to arrange flowers, a DJ, catering for the hundreds of guests and a hall for the wake, resplendent with crystal chandeliers. For Easton, the event is especially important because his mum had a difficult life. This is where she always was. Um, yeah, she, this was like... This is everything, really, and it's still... It's got a smell. Since I've locked it away, no one's really been in there. So, yeah. Easton's mum, Sharon, died at the age of 46. When Easton was only five, a mystery illness left Sharon paralysed from the neck down. She spent the next 20 years almost confined to one room in their East London flat. She couldn't do anything except for move her head, really. And it's a big, big shock that one time you're able to walk and it's not like he was ill. So it's like he was able to walk had a headache, gone to the hospital. The next minute you wake up and you can't move anything. She was young, only 27. She had a lot to deal with and a lot to get over. She had pictures all up there, some of her medication. That cross is still there. That was like, that used to be on top of her head. She used to put like uh, sweets and that. Sometimes she'd try and hide them from me in here. So she used to put them in a jar. So if I open the door, she would hear me in it and be like, oh, wait. Sharon's last wish was to mark the end of her life with a spectacular funeral. I think she deserves to be selfish at least once in a while. I think everyone does, and I think even if she didn't even want something big, I still most probably would have done it big because that's what I want to do for my mum. I believe it will be the biggest day of my mum's life. Um, we've planned it to be. So, yeah, let's hope that she's happy with it. Nottingham's top funeral parlour, A.W. Limbs, there's excitement in the air. They've got a new brochure. All our products and services and their prices. We're all excited because this is a new edition. We have the a brochure once a year with all the prices in. Pictures of everything that we do, the coffins, caskets, flowers. And we're just going to see who features this year. Stacey's in it. Page three. Page three? Page three. High up on their list of selling points is their fleet of luxury cars. This showroom houses our eight cars with a replacement value if we were going to buy new cars tomorrow of in excess of £2 million. The flagship of the fleet is a bespoke Rolls Royce, costing half a million pounds. In terms of funeral vehicles, in my mind, this is absolutely the ultimate. The specially designed hearse features LED lights, an automated rear door and coffin platform, and even an internal sound system that will play your favourite tracks. This car makes you feel a million dollars. The fact that it's a hearse puts a slightly different spin on that, but the car itself is incredible. Today, the person having their final journey in Matthew's exclusive hearse is Traveller Faino. The family has a long list of requests, so Matthew is having to pull out all the stops. We've got something to go on the bus. Just on the front. Balloons to undo. We've got red carpet to do. The distance factor, the amount of individual sort of items that this family have asked for, an awful lot of work's gone into it. The idea is that the last bit of the journey the casket does, we're going to put over red carpet for them. Why red carpet? To be able to have his. His very last journey as we get to the grave over the red carpet is, uh, is nice for the family. Thank you. In an effort to make this funeral stand out, the family has asked for a double-decker bus, a sports car and a Shetland pony. The Lamborghini that was round the corner is not here. The horses that were on their way are not yet here. We find with some of the more demanding clients, when they come in to organise a funeral, they've seen another funeral and they want to make sure that what they're providing in terms of the material items is 
just as good, if not very slightly better. The Lamborghini has arrived. But with no sign of the pony, Matthew has to head to the hotel to pick up the guests. OK. Yeah, any car now is fine. Any car now is fine. No, no, hello, no. The sisters have to go in the car. We have some respect when we get to the chapel. OK. Where's the pony, Matthew? The majority of the 400 strong crowd are meeting at the church. For the family, this is all about sending their brother Faino off as he lived. He nicked one years ago with the passengers. With the passengers on. Yeah, and put up more passengers on his way and charged them as well, by the way. <laughs> With the brief church service over, the congregation head to the cemetery for the final goodbye. OK, mate! To me, the importance of the funeral isn't for the deceased. The important part of a funeral to me is the process, really, for those people who are left behind, because they need to grieve and they need to find a way to move on. <laughs> the standout things on any travel funeral would be the volume of people, firstly, the volume or number of cars. Travellers share their emotion in a really public way. Rather than a lot of funerals where the atmosphere may be quiet and sombre, with the travellers there happy to be fairly loud. And they're quite happy with that. They don't feel in any way that that's disrespectful. It's the way that their community works. He had a beautiful send-off today, and all his family, they, they never let him out the sad way, they let him out happy way, what he would have wanted. He wouldn't want a sad funeral, not Fennel. He wanted everybody to be happy and carry on, and the way everything went for him. You know, he'd be looking down now from heaven, saying, look what he's all done, you know. With the burial underway, Matthew's job for the day is complete. I'm feeling good, it's gone well. Um, the weather's held, everything's come together. But everyone seems to be really pleased with what we've done. So, yeah, I think it's gone well. It's gone well. It's a feeling of elation. When you complete any funeral, it gives you job satisfaction that no other job can offer. If you can do that for a particularly demanding or difficult client, then the feeling is even more so. And travellers are some of the most demanding clients that I've ever worked for. <laughs> At Tea Cribs in East London, Undertaker Marcus still has a lot to do, preparing for Easton's mum's funeral. With a funeral like this, when everything's taken into account, it's probably one of the most expensive that's been here. But the fact that Sharon is being laid to rest in a catacomb presents some unique problems. A grave you just lower straight into, whereas with a catacomb, you've got to get it in a hole along a concrete floor, and the amount of friction that that's going to produce on the bottom of the concrete, plus its weight, it's going to be difficult. The weight is owing to its unusual lead shell, which is needed to preserve the body. You've got the person, you've then got the lead shell, you've then got the coffin. So they've all got to fit. A bit like Russian dolls. Right, let's go. With the funeral tomorrow, Marcus is having a final meeting with the family, including Easton's aunties and uncles. I'm Marcus. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Sandra. Hello, Sandra. I know Faye. I've met Faye. This is Patrick. That's right. Yes, and this... You've met me. I'm Derek. Hello, Derek. I'm Marcus. 
I'll assess the situation in the church as to whether we can carry or use the trolley. Yeah. Okay? Is there steps at the church? Yes. Okay, well, we can. We, we will just lift her over the steps. Mr. But I'm talking about the access in the church. If the door's too door small, door. or the door. pews are too small. The door of the church needs to be. Well, you, you've got two blokes standing with mum in, in the middle, so it's got to be quite wide. After six weeks of meticulous planning, emotions are running high, and Easton is feeling the pressure to get it right. Yeah. Well, I, I know what I've done, so I don't want people overriding and stuff that's already been sorted out. I wanted just the one picture of my mum to carry, and now everyone has tried to overtake everything, yeah, and no one's told me anything. Can I just say something to you, Easton? The picture that I have seen, I don't think they were appropriate. I got one done, it's just you and your mum. Blow it up. Yeah, there's always a lot of stress when it comes to a funeral because it's the last thing you can do for someone. Whatever photographs you give me, they're the ones I take. Yeah. You can I'm, edit I'm, it I'm, as it goes. There are times you've got to be a counsellor. The families might not agree on stuff and so you've got to try and compromise and find common ground between them and make it as best you can for them. Thank you. I think at that time when someone passes, um, there's a lot of emotions that are up and down. Everyone may have different views on certain things and it's a testing time for a lot of people. In a way, your emotions don't know how to process it and handle it, so you just think you can blow up <laughs> where you don't mean to. It's been six months since Nathan's funeral, and his burial site is only getting bigger. So this is Nace's grave. This is Nace's shrine. <laughs> this, is, this is where Mum comes all the time. She's here all the time. He's got his dog, his little dog that stays there. And the kids come and they put all their bits on there. And at least he's at home. That's the main thing. First year's the worst, isn't it? I think as time goes on, it doesn't get easier, it gets worse. It's, it's not, not being on the end of the phone and it's the not coming every time you come to see him, he's not here. I think that's the worst, worst bit. Constantly adding to the shrine, the family are now planning a headstone for Nathan. A life-size statue of him, made of the finest Italian marble, that will take a year to complete. Do you think you'll ever stop buying stuff and doing stuff? And... No, I think Christmas, birthday, it'll still be, you come up and you put your flowers on and, and I think even if you go in the shop, like you see little bits that you pick up still. Because you would have done, if you go somewhere and you see a nice shirt, you would have brought it for him anyway. So it's a bit different now, you just got to go to the garden centre and see nice bits. But you'll, we'll always buy bits and flowers and and keep it looking nice. We we'll never forget him. He's still, you know. After six weeks of planning, Easton is ready to lay his mum to rest. I think it was important for her to know how much she was loved and how much people cherished and respected what she'd done as a person. But first, they need to get the 35 stone casket into the church. We can actually come up, so effectively we're going half and half, yeah? And then go round. It's too yeah. steep, Barbara. Yeah, and then look, boom. Yeah. This is ridiculous. <laughs> After all his hard work, Easton is determined everything will be exactly as his mum would have wanted. This ain't the song, this ain't the song. This is, this is, thank you, Mama. This is not the song. This is not my song. This is thank you, Mama. I know my song. Have any plans? It's not the song. Relax. 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 Relax.
yeah, as, as a son, I think I myself put a lot of pressure on myself to make sure it was right and it was perfect for her. I need to thank, thank you for making my, our home such a special place to grow up in. You always put me first in every choice you made. So this is my final conversation. And he goes on to say, I will forever remember you. It's hard, I think, for anyone to lose any of their parents or their loved one, it's very hard. But for me, it's because, it's like, we weren't just my mum, she's like my best friend, like, we'd talk. I feel like I lost, in a way, I lost my best friend. One in ten of us pre-plan our funerals. So talking about what happens to us when we die is becoming less of a taboo. This is our embalming room. Embalming, in a nutshell, is a series of injections that remove the blood and the other fluids and replace them with something that is very similar in appearance but will just stop any of the deterioration. One client who's keen to plan her funeral is 44-year-old Sean. I yes. had open heart surgery. I found out I had a really big four centimetre hole in my heart, and I've been. You know, well, you've had that all of your life. Yeah, but I didn't even know it was misdiagnosed. Oh, yeah, gosh. I just panicked because I have three children as well. It just made me extremely anxious. Yeah. And as soon as I came out and I got well, I knew I had to sort it out and get it. Yeah, things sorted. Yeah. I think that actually everybody thinks about death and thinks about their own funeral and their own mortality. Whether they'd admit to you or not that they have is another thing. And what about makeup? Who do you want to do your makeup? Do you do makeup? I was going to say, I could do your makeup. Yeah. So you said about being buried or cremated, you know that they are the options. Yeah. Um, there are other options, are things like, you know, like people have had the cryogenics, you know, you'd be, you, that's where you're sort of like frozen. That's mm. around about £80,000 just for your head. This is the showroom. With more people now organising their own, this is just one example of the changing attitudes towards funerals. I think the most important thing is that we always try to push the boundary. If a client wants something that doesn't appear in our brochure, let's see if we can find it. If a client wants something that we've never heard of before, let's see what we can do. I wondered if it was possible to have a glass coffin, almost like a, a snow white glass, you know, fairy tale glass coffin. We live in an age now where people do expect so much more. And what may have been considered almost outrageous in the past by some of our families now is considered a really fitting and proper way to say goodbye to their loved one. For his mum's final journey, Easton has arranged for a second mode of transport in the form of a horse-drawn carriage to take Sharon through the streets of East London to the cemetery. It's time for Easton's mum to be put in her final resting place, her own chamber in the catacombs. Can you come to the right a bit, please? That's it, that's tiny bit, that's it, perfect. What's the wood, what's the wood, everyone, yeah? What's the wood? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. So lift and slide. One, two, three. Lift, three, push, go. And one, two, three. Yes. Thank you.
emotional. My day has been so emotional, but I think now it's the last of the emotion, and now it's rejoicing and celebrating time. Um, eat, drink, and celebrate her life, and then dance. You're gonna see a lot of dancing. <laughs> In keeping with the Caribbean tradition, the funeral party dances into the night. So it's more of a cultural thing. Dance, which we know is always about celebration, so it's just more about celebrating that person. Some people will say, like, you're mad for spending what you spend. Yeah, when you sit down and you actually think about it, um, it could be a mortgage. <laughs> it could be, um, but um, what, what, what is money compared to love, really? Mm -hmm.